How do you come in and change culture? How do you create culture? And as you know, leading change is, is tough because we have traditional ways. So I'm going to talk to you about the James Webb Space Telescope, the challenges, getting it over the goal line. In astrophysics and astronomy, we're always looking to answer questions. Uh, where do we come from? How do we fit into this universe? Are we alone? I wasn't campaigning for the job. Actually, I was campaigning not to take the job. After reluctance and a lot of time talking with my wife and, and a few mentors, uh, I agreed to, to take it on. Uh, Web was uh, developed in 29 different states. About 20,000 people touched this, technicians, engineers, scientists. But when I took over, I created a, a strategic approach. What are we trying to accomplish? Who is our customer? How do we communicate? Do we communicate data or information? Making sure everyone was aligned from uh, the lowest person on, on the team all the way up through NASA headquarters, through the administrator, and our stakeholders in OMB and Congress. There are many barriers, there are many reasons not to do things, but always think of the reasons to do it. When teams work together, discovery is unlimited. You start off today with the future in mind. So what does that future look like? When do we start? How do we get started? And how do we know we're there? The world gave us this mission to do, and that was our opportunity to give it back to the world. And across 29 states in the U.S. and 14 countries, our two big partners are ESA, European Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency, and both of them brought uh, pretty specific capability to the table. So I'm not going to get into a lot of technical details, but this is important for scale and scope. Uh, the, the major elements of this telescope are the mirror, the big mirror. You, you'll hear more about that in just a minute. On the back side of that is where the scientific instruments are. That's what processes all of that, that data that the mirror brings in. In the middle, we have that iconic uh, sun shield you'll see again in a minute. And then the brains, the, what we call the spacecraft bus beneath. So you can see on the top side, that, that telescope has to look off into deep space, deep, dark, cold space. And you can see how cold it gets. And of course, on the electronic side, you want it to be nice and toasty so electronics will work just well for many, many, many years. That's a huge difference in temperature you have to maintain through the life of this. It, it's unprecedented. So more about the, the scale and scope, I'm doing some comparisons between Hubble and, and Webb. You can see the, the mirror itself for Hubble. It's a monolithic mirror, 2.4 meters in size. You can see Webb, 18 segmented mirrors, total of six and a half meters in size. So you put it up here on the stage, it's gonna take up a whole lot of room. And what's important on that, to do astrophysics, you need, just like taking pictures, you need something big to collect light. The more light you collect, more photons, the more accurate data you get. Each of those 18 mirrors have to act as one. And we have to fold it up to launch it and unfold it in space. Uh, so pretty amazing. And over here, you see that this is Hubble. It's about the size of a school bus. Webb is the size of a tennis court, particularly that sun shield makes it that large. So it's almost twice the size, but half the mass or weight, uh, which a lot of engineer, engineering ingenuity had to go into that selection of materials, how we actually design it, put it together, and unfold it. Move my click here. So going back to that sun shield, so this was a new technology, and I know many of you are technologies in one way or another here. So Webb has 10 new technologies never developed and or flown before which is unprecedented again. Normally for our big missions, we may have two or three new technologies, and that's a challenge, a real challenge. We have 10. And in most cases, the technology, like in this case, it's just the membrane itself, the material, getting it to a certain, what we call a technology readiness level of maturity. Now you have to take that and make it into five different layers of a sun shield that you have to fold up. You'll see it folded up in a minute. You have to fold it up, so you can put it inside of a rocket fairing, you can launch it and unfold it in space. And I'll talk more about that unfolding in just a minute. So since we're in sunny Florida, um, 
and we, we worry about putting on sunscreen and things like that, and I forget the numbers, 40, 50, 60, keep you nice and cool. Just think of one million. And that's what this sun shield actually does, which is part of keeping the thing uh, nice and cold on one side and toasty on the other side. Constructing the James Webb Space Telescope, a mission led by NASA with its partners, the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency, requires the collaboration of thousands of people from across the United States, Canada, and Europe. The James Webb Space Telescope is the most ambitious and complex space science mission humanity has ever undertaken. Webb is NASA's highest priority science mission. This is the optical and science segment of the Webb Space Telescope in one of the largest clean rooms in the world at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. This half of the observatory element successfully passed a series of rigorous vibration and acoustic tests to ensure Webb's optics and science instruments can handle the stresses of launch. This element was packed and transported to the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas for cryogenic testing inside its massive test facility simply called Chamber A, a national historic landmark for its work during the Apollo missions. Successfully completing the optical telescope element was a significant milestone. And now we look forward to completing final test of the spacecraft element and then integrating both halves into the observatory. So that's the, what we call the, the optical telescope and science instrument side. So if you put it in halves, so that's one half, and the other half is the sun shield and the spacecraft bus. Now you, you saw this going through its, uh, what we call mechanical testing, the acoustics to simulate uh, the noise inside the rocket fairing during launch, and then vibration uh, speaks for itself during launch. So that one half went through testing pretty decent, had some challenges. By the way, when we went to, to Houston to complete testing, that was the same time Hurricane Harvey hit. So we had to work through Hurricane Harvey. So I'll just tell you, during the life of this, if you do it for 20 years, it's bound to happen, right? We went through snowmageddon. We went through hurricanes. And some parts of the country, we had some tornadoes for different, different pieces of this. And, and I'm losing track. But everything you can imagine, uh, lots of wildfires in California uh, had to go through, through all of that. And then this thing called COVID came which was on top of all of that. So we've worked through some real challenges. I know, depending on location, many of you have done work through a lot of those as well. So you saw that acoustics testing on that half. So the other, other half, which you'll see in just a second, uh, the, the spacecraft element we call the bus and the sun shield, when it went through its acoustics testing and we took it out of the chamber and moved it over to the vibration facility, we always do a quick inspection and something you never want to see, there were screws of, we call them fasteners, laying on the floor. Now that's a bad day. Now, what's, what's not so bad about it, it happened on the ground and not in space. So we, we have or had 350 or so, what we call single point failures on this thing. So a single point failure means a single failure can take the mission down. And of course, uh, some believe some of those screws could have come out and we would have been okay, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't put any bets on that. So we had to overcome 350 single point failures. And again, you want to fix these problems on the ground. And then you have latent problems that you don't even know you have. So we had to do some major audits to go through the whole system that we had built to date and to see if we had any, any latent problems or obvious problems. A lot of reasons for that failure. Uh, humans, humans were the cause. They always kind of get in the way. So I, so I showed you the first half. I'm going to show you the integration. Uh, you can see that first half over on the right-hand side there. All of this is in one big chamber out on the West Coast. You can see the spacecraft and the sun shield on the other side right here. And we have to integrate all that together. You can see the size of the people versus the system. People on cherry pickers and diving boards to do this work. Also in clean suits.
Now, they move pretty fast on video, uh, but that process took about three months to integrate and deploy. And deploying was not trivial. We, we deployed, um, depending on how you count, four times total uh, for testing. And every single time, we had some kind of problem when we deployed. That could have been mission critical if it had happened on orbit. So a lot of learning, a lot of redoing, uh, but you have to get it right. So as some folks say, you, you go fast, but you don't rush, because rushing is a real killer. And I know you have some of those same problems. You're trying to deploy things in the field, and the field is saying, hey, guys, you're too fast. You don't understand. Uh, but we got to get it out anyhow. Um, but just don't rush as you go fast. So this is um, the telescope with the sun shield folded up, and it folds on each side of the telescope. You can see the mirrors on each side, the wings folded back. So that's in kind of a, what we call a semi-stowed position. We, we're getting it ready now for shipping, coming up pretty fast. This is in the, the final configuration, the stowed configuration. We actually launch it, we put, the, put it inside the rocket fairing to launch it in this orientation. We lay it down on the side in a shipping container uh, to actually ship it, uh, but that same configuration. So we shipped to the launch site. Uh, we put this on a ship. Um, from just south of LAX, uh, and shipped it down the Pacific coast through the Panama Canal around the top side of South America into uh, Karoo, French Guiana. Uh, we, we got it into the clean room there. Now, one of the reasons for shipping was the, in French Guiana, the main city where the airport is, um, no problem shipping, you flying it in, which would be easier. Uh, but we, we didn't have the capacity for some of the bridges either the, the width or the, the weight capacity to drive it over uh, to Karoo to the, to the base. So that's why we had to ship it. Also, uh, the way the world is today, we worry about, not so much in this hemisphere, but we worry about pirates and all kinds of bad actors taking over particular national assets, right? So we had to have some um, assessments done. And we say our, folk, our buddies across the river if you're in the D.C. area, across the river means the DOD or intelligence community. So they had to do some assessments to make sure we didn't have any issues there, and it was, uh, it was pretty easy. Then you have to make decisions, and you all have to make these decisions along the way. Uh, do we turn off the transponders on the boat so no one can track it? You know, you can download all these apps and track every ship in the world uh, pretty, pretty close. Uh, so transponders on some of the time, off some of the time all the small decisions you have to make to do big things. Now this is, uh, we're getting pretty close. We're at the launch site. Uh, on the left, you can see the, the, uh, the telescope in the stowed position. You can see the size of the people. We have what we call shower curtains all around it. You have to keep it nice and clean. Uh, when you're around this, you can't wear makeup, even if you have a bunny suit on. Uh, you can't wear you know, perfume, cologne, you can't smoke and go in there for a certain amount of time without drinking water. That's how sensitive those mirrors are to contamination. So that was pretty important. You can see the rocket fairing on the top right and all of the emblems on there uh, getting ready for final encapsulation. This was uh, in the launch uh, control center about 30 minutes before launch. So I did a, a quick uh, pre-brief and I tailed it back around the corner uh, to my seat on console. And then uh, we didn't plan it this way. If I could do it again, I would, but, but we didn't plan it this way. We ended up uh, slipping to Christmas morning. And again, all the debates your team get into, this went all the way up to the administrator. He was actively involved in the decision. Do we try to launch on Christmas Day? But when you're doing launches, depending on the rocket, you get so many back-to-back -back attempts. In this case, we had back-to-back -back day attempts. And then you have to scrub for one or two days, depending on what it is. Um, so a lot of issues around do we try to go on Christmas Day. This was still COVID time, and we had to fly everybody down on, on a private plane and get everybody back on a private plane. Each day we slipped, we started losing access to planes. And I'll tell you, <laughs> We couldn't find a plane in the world to get us back that, later on that day. 
And we, we got lucky on one particular plane, and that turned out to be a, a nightmare as well. Uh, so it's pretty tough. Um, and, and, and I forgot to mention, when, when COVID hit back in uh, 2020, the third weekend in March, we decided to get everybody on planes who were on the West Coast, most of them were from the East Coast, get them back East. At the time, they were threatening to shut down the airlines in, in the U.S. Uh, the folks out at, the, at Northrop, the prime contractor, um, sent them home. So for two and a half months, we went from uh, two 10-hour shift, seven days a week, to one eight-hour shift, five days a week. And many of those were not the right combination of people. People had uh, pre-existing conditions, concerns. The throughput getting in and out of the clean room was extremely slow. So we, we took a real hit. It took us about a year to get back to the efficiency level we were at, even after we got everybody back. Uh, so this was pretty tough. And I'll, um, I don't think our Canadian partners made it to the launch site at all. That's when the Omicron variant really picked up about a week before launch and people started bunkering down. Uh, the, the folks in Europe had a private plane. They had to cancel that and, and go commercial. Uh, and that was another whole challenge.